Hi, Joe. Thanks for helping my project. Could you say a little bit about yourself? Hi, yes. Well, my name is Joe Luttrell, and I am the founder and CEO of a company called Cube. We design and develop uh, pocket cube satellites as our primary business uh, with a focus on Earth observation. Uh, I've been doing this now since 2018 officially, played around with it since 2013, have been a rocket head since I was a little little kid, uh, watched the Apollo 11 landing, and then uh, the Apollo Soyuz test mission that really uh, cemented it, and I've been dabbling in space ever since. Uh, that's that's awesome. I, could you tell me about how si uh, how big uh, like the satellites you work with are? Okay, well, I can actually show you um, one of them because I, I have a model here. I don't know why it's here, but it's fortuitous. Okay, so pocket cubes like CubeSats um, are measured in a specific unit. So like CubeSats are measured in U's, which is a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter cube. Pocket cubes are measured in P's, which is a five by five by five centimeter. Okay, so what I'm showing you here, this is a 3P pocket cube. That's the entire size of it. So I see solar panels and yep. it looks like there's a, a camera entrance on one side. Yep. Or... Camera opening on one side and then we have a GPS receiver on the other. Um, we've since expanded these to have deployables. So instead of just having solar panels around a couple of sides, we have uh, solar wings that fold out. Um, so our small sats generate about uh, 10 to 12 watts of power, depending upon their needs. And our larger satellites can generate up to 26 watts of power. So. Um, is it able to use like gyroscopes to orient itself or little yep. thrusters or? Um, well, the, what we're working on right now is we're designing uh, propulsion systems in junk, conjunction with uh, applied, applied ion systems out of New York and a company called Pork Chop over in Europe. They're working on different uh, thruster capabilities for us. But yeah, we orient our satellites using um, reaction wheels and magnetorquers. So we have pretty accurate uh, pointing capabilities. Now, a reaction wheel, is, I kind of understand, I, I envision it as being like, a, you know, the, the guy with the spinning wheel who like tilts it left and right and makes the chair spin. So it's like the mm -hmm. gyroscopic effects, but that magnet torquer, I haven't heard of that before. Okay, so the magnet torquer orients with the Earth's magnetic field, um, and it's essentially an electromagnet. So what we do is we, um, up, so like we use the reaction wheel to get our gross pointing capability. And then we use the magnet torquers to kind of gently nudge the satellite in, in fractions of a degree increments. It's just a little quick pulse of electricity, creates a magnetic field, interacts with Earth's magnetic field, and twists the satellite ever so slightly. Wow, that is awesome. So, I mean, that's essentially equivalent to having, I mean, it's an electromagnet, and you kind of orient it how you want it, and then have... Uh, energize it and then it mm -hmm. it kind of turns into the magnetic force uh if you will that's yeah that, that's pretty much it um and we've de designed a system that fits all that in a four centimeter cube so um and how many of these have you launched so far um we have one that's currently encapsulated waiting launch here in december we have uh, two more that'll be going in march we have a CubeSat that we've designed for teachers in space. Um, it's actually the, a repeat of one that we launched earlier. Uh, it unfortunately was on Firefly Alpha, which as we all know, had a um, rapid unplanned disassembly um, a few minutes into flight. And you know, they actually got some good data. We knew that it was a risk. They're flying us again. Um, we just had to rebuild the satellite. Um, yeah, this time we're building a spare as we go along. So that if something does happen, we can replace replace it immediately, or hopefully in the future we'll launch it and it'll join the first satellite. It's called the Serenity series. We figured Firefly got to name the ship Serenity. So, <laughs> no, I, I I love it. I love the Firefly uh, series as well. I just, uh, it's great to see it kind of living on, if nothing other than in in real actual. Uh, hardware names. Um, so how does it work from a financial perspective? Do you have like insurance on the um, 
satellite and then that pays and funds for the rebuild or is this all a uh, net new cost for you? Um, for the, the CubeSat we launched, um, there was no insurance on that. Um, <laughs> to be honest, our satellites are so inexpensive to build insurance is kind of a waste of time. Now, the insurance we do carry is for impacting the uninvolved public. In other words, if our satellite were to re-enter and a piece hit somebody on the head, okay, we have insurance for that. But as far as, you know, insuring the, the actual satellite, I mean, we're building vehicles for less than $100,000, which is unheard of. And it's actually cheaper for us to just build the second one than to pay for the insurance for launch. And yes, it's a risk, but it's um, a calculated and accepted risk. That that makes sense. And uh, about your insurance thing, I liken it to auto insurance, where uh, you're required to get like the liability insurance and the the harm to third, but then that full coverage is is optional in terms of mm -hmm. covering your own car. Yep. So, yep. And since we pay for all of our satellites as we go, um, there's no outstanding bills. Everything is done, you know, in cash where we can. Um, I think we have credit with two organizations and we try and pay those bills as soon as they come in. So we run this all as a, as a cash operation right now. Um, but yeah, we're, it's all been cash out of, uh, my pocket or through sales and we're taking on investors. Now we're actually working on a pre-seed round. So, um, and how does it work from a communications perspective? Do you have, uh, ground stations that you work with around the globe to stay in constant communication or does it communicate to other satellites? Uh... Yeah, for for the, the Serenity satellite, that is a um, amateur radio band. It is an educational satellite. Um, it is providing services to the amateur radio community. So that one fits squarely into that band. Um, and anybody who's on SatNogs or has a ham radio, can tune into the satellite. Um, you send it a, a basic command. It's actually published on the Teachers in Space website, but you send it a command, it'll send you back some some packets. It's pretty, uh, pretty neat to see. Um, as far as our satellites, those are still in the experimental phase, and we do have a specific license for a UHF frequency, and we use that frequency for our satellites during our testing phase. We do plan to move our later satellites to S and X band, which requires significant licensing. So yeah, we've, we've got we've got the, the experts in regulation and they're going to handle that detail for us. Uh, that's really exciting. I um, had a technician license like uh, 20 years ago and I haven't done anything with it and I, I'm sure it's lapsed, but uh, now, now I feel like I need to go and get it again just so I could talk to your satellite. Yep. If you're, you can receive on 437.1, you can talk to us. <laughs> um, can you give an idea on some of the types of interactions that amateur radio operator could have with the, the satellite? Okay. Well, there, there are two main things that you can do with the satellite. The first is you can be one of our data gathering points. The satellite has several sensors on board, including two dosimeters. We're measuring a radiation. This is a radiation experiment created by some high school students out of uh, Gloversville, New York. And the idea is they've invented, well, they've formulated a material that they believe can protect astronauts from, you know, intense doses of radiation. Well, how do you test that? You put two dosimeters side by side. One has the material in front of it. One has essentially uh, the same components so that you have, you, you test to control. So this is our control. This is the actual experiment. And we watch for radiation clicks. And that data needs to be downloaded. It can be a lot of data. So if you ping the satellite and say, give us the data, it will send the, the data down. The other is um, you can get a list of who's contacted the satellite. So when you send your, your packet up, we, we collect your call sign, and then you can request, well, who's talked to the satellite? And it will send the list of all the call signs that have successfully talked to the satellite. So those are the two kind of, one, one's more like a, a, a game or a, yes, I did it. And the other is uh, actually doing scientific research. And all of that data is gathered for students across the globe to use 
they can run you know analyses on it and see are we right with our assumptions or are we wrong so here's our hypothesis this material will protect from radiation uh, prove us right or wrong based on the data but we also have a uh, picture taking capability now this is restricted but you can request on the teachers in space website for the camera to take a snapshot of any location on planet Earth. Um, you give us the GPS coordinates, we send those to the satellite, we take a picture, uh, it goes through the proper channels to be vetted, and if it's cleared for use, then we will send you the picture. I, I mean, this is awesome. I, Whenever I have these conversations with like the general public, uh, people at Starbucks, um, I, I get a general sense of, you know, what does space have to do with me? You know, I mean, like, I'm not going to be an astronaut. I'm not a billionaire. I'm, uh, you know, um, it seems like a lot of money. I pay taxes, you know, the, the whole, whole list goes on. But mm -hmm. this satellite uh, and the amateur radio operating aspect of it actually allows for people to participate in a very direct, meaningful way. And uh, I'm, I'm very enthused, enthused about it. So uh, when, when does it go up again? When's the... Uh, Relaunch. This is, is scheduled for the end of the year. Um, Firefly has not released an official launch date yet, but as soon as they have one, um, we will be publishing it um, both on our web page and on the Teachers in Space web web page. Um, and when you mentioned, you know, talking to people at, at Starbucks and other places, and they ask, "Well, what good is space?" Okay, well, let's say we're not going to use space anymore. Let's just turn everything off right now. Okay. You just lost half of your television channels, if not more. You've lost the interconnect for some banks because they still use those. Um, all your remote systems just went offline because we use satellite because you can't get wires there. I mean, it's a, it's a solar array and the equipment. And if there's no satellite to talk to, we don't know what that equipment is doing. And that includes gas valves, oil pumping stations, sewage treatment pumping stations, those are all on those types of systems. Okay, so that goes away. Communications goes away. Okay, so half of the uh, systems that we use for communicating across the ocean just disappeared. Okay, all of your weather is now a guess. We have accurate weather predictions because of satellites in orbit. That's all gone. Okay, and as far as monitoring Earth for climate change, you just lost all that too. So you basically take away space, you take away your eyes to the future and a lot of your communications in the present. So while space doesn't seem like it directly impacts everybody, there is not a person on planet Earth that is not touched by space. That's my spiel. <laughs> no, and you know, uh... That conversation would be very short and convincing, and they would walk away with a greater appreciation of uh, uh, how how space and space-based assets help impact our life uh, in terms of weather satellites, GPS, communications. I think 99.999% of the people would say that's worthwhile. Uh, you know, let's keep doing that. I, I think mm -hmm. where we really run into a more difficult conversation, though, is around the, the human space flight. Uh, because the, it's hard to draw a direct connection between the human space flight and, and all those other things that you mentioned. That's true. But we humans have an interesting problem. There are a, are a specific set of us who are always itching to go exploring. Okay. If we did not set out to explore space, let's 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 back it up. Well, we don't we don't need to go and explore anything further than the east coast of the United States. That territory, it's 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 a waste of time and money to go and explore it. We'll just leave it where it is. We don't need that. What would the United States look like? What happens if in Europe we decided, no, nah, we're good here. We don't need to go across the ocean. We don't need to find a shorter route to India uh, for spice trade. We don't need to find shorter routes to China, what we've got works fine. We're good. Don't need to explore or find anything new. Okay. It's because of that mentality of wanting to move forward and find the unknown and make it known. 
That's why we have the sciences that we do. That's why we have the exploration that we do. It's why, why would why would anybody want to go and climb Mount Everest? Okay. It's a very expensive proposition. It's now a very busy tourist spot. But why would you want to risk life and limb to go to the highest point on Earth? For some people, that's a thrill. And it's that exploration of the unknown that people are, are after. And once that unknown becomes known, people settle down for a little bit. And then the next thing you know, they're itching to find the next unknown. And right now, the next unknowns, there are two big unknowns, the oceans and space. We can go in both directions. And that exploration will lead to discovery of new things. We don't even know what we're going to discover because it's unknown. But once we discover it, it will most likely be life changing. If you had told people in 1976, when you know the first Apple computers were for coming out, the Apple One, which you put together as a kit, if you told people that every last one of you is going to have a computer more powerful than this in your hand that will be always on, always connected to the internet, you can look up any information you could possibly dream of, they would have thought you were crazy. But it's because people were willing to explore that unknown that we've slowly miniaturized all of our equipment to the point where what you have in your hand today, the wealthiest people in the world in 1990 or even in the year 2000 could not own. Not bad for a few decades. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. Yeah, it's amazing what uh, competition, miniaturization, um, you know, kind of information technology type. I mean, I, I just look at your satellite uh, as a, a way and, and I'm comparing it to uh, what sort of envision for the Breakthrough Starshop, uh, you know, satellite, which is supposed to be, you know, a one gram <laughs> size credit card <laughs> device mm -hmm. that's able to communicate uh, over interstellar distances and is able to take uh, pictures and sensor readings while traveling at 20% the speed of light. You know, it's like, how do we get to that in 20 years? That's mm -hmm. going to be amazing. Yeah. And people say, well, that's impossible until it's done. And then it's no longer impossible. We'll get there. I, it might take longer than we anticipated to get the, a, a system down that small. But even if you had a 10 gram unit that you could accelerate to 10% the speed of light, and don't think of it as using a single device. You're sending a swarm of these. So as long as you have some part of the swarm intact, you can do a lot more. So that's actually how we use our pocket cubes. Our pocket cubes use a flock technology. So we have, like say we have a group of four satellites that are in, in, a, in a particular node of our constellation. Three of those satellites are redundant. So like two of them will have optical cameras. So if one goes out, there's another one, okay? But one that has an optical camera might have uh, a radiation sensor or an infrared sensor. And the other one would have just the opposite. But then the other satellite has the radiation and the infrared sensor by itself. So any combination of satellites, you lose one, you're still operational. And the cost is still a fraction of what it takes to build even a 3U CubeSat today. So it's it's just a matter of numbers. It is. But, you know, about that thrill, you know, people doing it because of their innate desire. Um, I feel like a lot of people's ability to resonate with that depends upon their personal experience. Uh, somebody who goes like rock climbing and camping and hiking they're like, ah, what's next? Where can I go? And they're, they're thinking about Mount Everest. But you know, the, the person that grew up in like the city and they've never been outside the city and they just know classrooms and schedules and you know, very controlled environments. Uh, I, I believe that they probably are less likely uh, to really, they're like, oh, we don't ever go out into the jungle. That's dangerous, you know? And mm -hmm. maybe they're a little less likely to, to want to explore. And I was just wondering, you know, if, what your thought was about that line of thinking? Um, you're not wrong. Um, cities tend to draw people who are very um, comfortable. We'll just call it that way. They like how things work. 
All right, they like slow change, even though cities tend to be more progressive than the countryside. Uh, change is still slow there when it comes to the way things work. And the difficulty is you've got that, that young girl in the inner city who has very little opportunity. How do we instill in that person this sense of adventure? And that's part of what we're hoping to do, both with Teachers in Space and what I do here at CUBE. We want to get the next generation involved in this. And CUBE has an extensive internship program. We currently have two interns who are working with us. Um, when they graduate out, then we'll have two more interns. Ultimately, we want to have a team of about 10 to 12 interns working with our professionals. That helps instill that. It's like if you go to somebody and say, hey, how'd you like to build a satellite? They'll get, you know, huh? I can't do that. So, yeah, we think you can. Want to try? And then we bring them into our lab and show them some of the basics, turn them loose, let them fail, let them fail quickly, show them how to go overcome that failure. And then that builds that thirst for wanting to do the next thing. And now suddenly there's a desire to make that happen. Teachers do this in mass. Okay, so that's what teachers in space is. We focus on internships. Teachers in space focuses on the teachers. So what they do is they instill in the teachers this desire. And then the teacher can instill that in their students. And now you have a multiplier effect. And that's worked well. Nearly a thousand teachers have been directly influenced by teachers in space. Tens of thousands of students have. And they're doing amazing things. I mean, who would think that a high school class could come up with a material that has properties for radiation protection? Or another one in Melbourne, Florida, that came up with a protein folding experiment for the International Space Station. And that's where the adventure is. So maybe you don't want to get on the rocket and fly, but there's still adventure in discovering those things. And yeah, we, we like to instill that. And we try to reach those particular markets to help them realize there's more than just the city. There's a complete world out here beyond the schedules, beyond the classroom. There's lots to do. Let's get you into it. Uh, where are you physically located? We are located in Akron, Pennsylvania, right smack dab in the middle of Amish country. Okay. Uh, how'd you end up there? Um, let's just say I took a roundabout way to get here. Um, I hired on with uh, MapQuest back in 2008, worked there for a little bit, moved on to working in uh, writing real estate software for a while. So if you got lost, it's not my fault, okay? Um, I worked on the APIs. I worked on the tools that made it possible for the maps to function. Um, but yeah, and then I, I, I moved into, uh, I did education for a while. I actually programmed the back end of an online school for four years. And then I said, okay, uh, I've done water quality engineering just so I could understand what happens. I and mean, when you drink a, a, a cup of coffee, where does it go? What happens to it? Most people don't want to know. And I can tell you, you still don't want to know. <laughs> uh, but those experiences led me to back to, you know, this is great information. And that's going to, those are tools in my tool belt. Now let's get back to space. And now I had these tools of, well, what do you want to look at when you build a satellite? Well, why don't we monitor Earth's water? Hey, there's an idea. Or why don't we monitor forestry services? What if we had systems that could identify forest fires or help predict drought as custom systems, not just data that we pull and try and extrapolate from existing satellites? So that's, that's the roundabout answer to, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I've done a lot. Okay. I, I've earned every last one of these gray hairs. <laughs> I understand. And so um, like you're in interns, where do they come from usually? Um, our interns typically, um, our first intern actually came from a makerspace. Um, I was looking for some help. I, I was a, a one guy shop at the time. 
I was like, I need some help. Let me see if I can find somebody that I can help teach to build things the way I want them built. That was my original thought. And we came across this young man um, and he turned out to be an exceptional find. I, mean, I, I literally posted on, on the bulletin board, hey, I'm looking for an intern, anybody interested? And he said, yeah, I'm kind of interested. We got together and now he, he's here every week. Um, he's learning more and more about how electronics are put together and he's done, done a fantastic job. The other one was a, a reference from a friend. He said, hey, I know this guy, you might be able to use him. And he turned out to want to do aerospace engineering as his major in college. Like, okay. Um, and he, he, was, he was a perfect fit. And he's doing uh, our communication side now. Um, he's still in college. He goes to uh, Tuskegee University. And he's just been an exceptional addition to our team. And we actually go through several universities now. We have, well, Thaddeus Stevens is one that we're talking to now about internships. We're drawing from the local market. Eventually, we want to draw from more of a statewide market. Um, we are talking with Carnegie Mellon University about maybe bringing on some interns from there. And it, it's just slowly expanding out. You just make the connections. It's like, it, it really is about who you know um, as well as what you know. Is it, you put out the word, hey, I'm looking for X. Hey, I don't have X, but I know somebody who has X. Let me give you their number. And then boom, and your network expands and expands. And they might not have the answer, but they might know somebody who does. And just be curious, ask questions. So that's how we, that's how we found them. We asked the question and we got the response. Yeah. I need somebody that knows X. I, well, I know V and I know somebody that's upside down V and we could put them together. <laughs> right. And that works fine. Um, like we're, one of the things we're doing now, we're working on building a test rig for our satellites. The last one was provided to us, but it's not ours and it's currently not available. It's like, okay, well, how do you, how do you keep a satellite hermetically sealed while you shake it as if it's going on the rocket? All right. Here's how we design it. Well, we don't have that material. How do we do, how do we use the materials we have to build it? And then you give the the challenge to people and turn them loose, and you end up with some crazy ideas, some of which work. <laughs> uh, we're we're actually going on a a tour of uh, a local facility here in Houston uh, next month called Dynaquel. They do qualification testing for all sorts of things, including aerospace. And one of the things they have is a shaking table, you know, mm -hmm. thermal and vacuum and uh, everything else. So um, do you have similar facilities available um, in your part of the country? Yes, uh, we actually use for, well, for our vibration testing, we use a company called ITS, Integrated Testing Solutions out of Schenectady, New York. Um, that's where I was born. So it's kind of an interesting coincidence. <clears throat> So they're a couple hours away. Um, our TVAC testing, we do in-house. We have our own TVAC unit here. Um, ultimately, because of the number of satellites we're going to fly, we will have our own testing capabilities in-house. It's just going to be cost effective. If you're launching 100 satellites and it's costing you $5,000 to have that satellite tested, it's a lot cheaper to buy the test gear and hire the people to run the test gear than it is to keep paying an outside service. So we do see that happening. But right now we use ITS for our vibe test. We do our own TVAC. Um, all of our EM we do in-house. And uh, yeah, it's you, you find the right people and you make it happen. <laughs> well, I, can you talk a little bit about the, the business model? So on the commercial side, the actual, like, can you describe your customers and and uh, why they might go with your company versus uh, something else? Well, most of our customers have wanted custom satellites. They want to have a specific mission happen. Um, one is an internet of things. Another one is cybersecurity. We have the teachers in space with the, the amateur satellite. So it, it, we've been more of a build shop, but our ultimate goal is to be a company that provides space as a service. Okay. This is where I'm going to tie back into the water quality. Okay, I spent a few years crawling around in sewers and water treatment facilities and looking at how we actually monitor our water. And 
I unfortunately have to say that it's dreadful and we're the best in the world at it. Hmm. Could we find a way of monitoring water that works better? And the answer is yes, you could build an Earth observation satellite dedicated to our water resources. So that was our primary focus. It's like, let's build a satellite constellation that monitors water. What would that look like? And so we started building the, the, the model as a, it's close to a SAS, but it's a SAS with data analytics already built in. So between our experts and the machine learning tools that we've created, yeah, it's become a buzzword, but we really, we use machine learning, not AI, okay? Um, with those systems, the idea is if I'm running a water treatment plant and there is an incident that happens upriver from me that might impact the quality of water I'm delivering to customers, I want to know that. I don't care about the data analysis. I don't need all of that. I need an alert to get to me and my crew. So we're working on reducing space to essentially the old pager model so that here the plant manager can get a text message and an alert that says, yeah, you need to change your plant operations because the water level has risen six inches um, upriver and it's gonna hit you in about two, three hours. That kind of information is invaluable to a water plant operator because then they can adjust their systems. For example, here in Lancaster County, we had an incident after a storm that resulted in the water in the Susquehanna River being contaminated. That meant that the city of Lancaster had to shut off its water treatment facility and run on its reserve water tank until that incident passed. It's nice to know that you have to prepare for that because you can shut your systems down in an orderly manner and then be ready to spin them up. The notice came pretty late and it was a frantic shut it down kind of thing in order to protect the water supply for the customers. And think about it, there's, um, for a lot of communities, the wastewater uh, effluent, it's called. Okay, so the water comes, the, the sewage comes into the wastewater treatment plant. It's processed, it's turned into you know, effluent, which is um, close to drinkable, but not. That goes into the river, it's mixed with river water that's now called raw water. And within 500 yards downstream, there's an intake for the next community to get their water. Well, what happens if this plant overflows and dumps raw sewage into the river? Mm -hmm. yeah, and, I know it goes into the intake for the next village. Right, and so you want to avoid those as much as possible because they cause serious issues. I mean, suddenly you have to do different treatment. There's a whole different treatment regime if you've got raw sewage in your water that you need to treat for. Um, and it can get very expensive chemical wise. But instead, if I have a reserve and I know that that event happened, I can shut everything down, run off of the reserve until the problem passes, then start my system back up, replenish my reservoir, and then keep going. So that's, that's the model we were after was to help with those situations and make it as easy as possible for the end user. So what we provide is not a lot of data for data analysis. Although if you want to buy our data, hey, it's for sale. <laughs> okay. um, but it's really that service is what we're wanting to provide. We want people to like uh, the fire department to know, hey, we're seeing some activity up in the mountains that you need to be alerted to that could potentially be a forest fire. Wouldn't it be neat to have an advance notice that that's coming? Or what about a farmer to be able to know that his uh, soil water content has shifted? We're building satellites to do that. Now, usually they're very big satellites to do this sort of thing. We're building small satellites to do it. So you put a whole bunch of them up. And if you lose one, who cares? You replace it.
but you build a, a net, kind of like Tony Stark's, he wanted to build a shield around the earth. Okay, we want to build a shield around the earth that looks at the earth and monitors what's going on in nature to help protect humanity and get that data to the right people. Well, uh, the other side of having many satellites is, well, I guess, first of all, we're, we're kind of at time. I didn't know if you could stay a little bit longer or if you, you had a little longer. I'm good. Okay. Um, uh, so what about orbital debris, having so many uh, satellites up there and, and making sure that, uh, you know, there's an appropriate end of life for each of the satellites and that type of thing? Yep. Um, that's why we build into all of our satellites an end of life circuit so that on a single command or a lack of commands. So let's say the satellite's our transceiver system has just completely failed. Then it's a useless satellite. So it starts the deorbit process. Now, we build our satellites out of materials that guarantee that nothing's coming back. When you hit the Earth at that velocity, you know, Mach 25 has a tendency to ruin things, um, except titanium. Titanium seems to survive just about anything. So we don't build with titanium. All of our materials are designed to vaporize in the upper atmosphere and not cause any issues. So we really take our orbital um, neighborhood seriously we want to be a good neighbor we've designed all of our satellites and one hitting a satellite this size is while not zero possibility it's still a very low possibility so they're small they're hard to hit they're easily to track but they're hard to hit and by keeping it small keeping it lightweight having mitigation plans and if our satellite takes a direct hit, it's not going to shatter and leave pieces all over the place. That's part of our design. They don't come apart. Um, if we get hit, it's going to just be a dead satellite. And since we're so low, our orbital lifespan is three years and it just burns up in the atmosphere. That's it. It's done. So um, we've tried to plan out for all mitigation possibilities on orbit to be a good neighbor. Is orbital debris going to become a problem? Yes, yes it is. We're working on satellites to help with that too. That's uh, amazing. And uh, if people want to know more about this, is how do they, what's your website? Um, right now our website is mini-cubes.com, uh, but we're working on um, our new website, which will just be qub.space. Okay, and I um, wanted to jump back uh, about 50 years uh, to uh, Apollo 11 and the moon landing. How old were you when that happened? Two and a half. Okay, so not, not really um, something you were aware of at the, the time then. Oh, I was actually very aware of it. Um, I, can, I can recall the day because my dad was also interested in this. Okay, now set the Wayback Machine to 1969. My parents had the choice to buy a new car or a color television because they cost about the same. Hmm. And my dad, looking forward to the moon landing and this new technology, bought the color television. He hitchhiked to work for the next you know, six months before they were able to save enough money to get a car. And he was very angry when the transmission from the moon was in black and white. Oh my gosh. How much cheaper was a black and white TV? Um, they were still fairly expensive. Um, I, a television was a luxury still. It wasn't an everyday thing. Um, the, the best thing that I can, uh, uh, let's see, how can I, what would be a, a technology that changed so rapidly? Think about DVD players. Okay. They were the fastest machine to come out, drop in price, and then vanish because the technology became outdated. Okay. But when DVD players first came out, they were $1,500, $2,000. The same thing or, with the VCR. Or even a laser disc before that. The laser disc players, they were expensive pieces of equipment. But as time goes on and manufacturing is, improves, the cost becomes cheaper and cheaper. Now we think television, okay, my dad bought a 
an RCA color television, okay? The remote was me and my brother, okay? My dad would say, get up and change the channel, and you went up and you turned the knob. Um, and it cost as much as a car. And today you can go and buy a 55-inch television set in 4K, which is more than 16 times the resolution of the television my father bought and pay less than $500 for that. And my dad paid thousands for that television set. And, and it's much we, lighter, much lighter. You're probably going to carry, you carry two of these TVs and not break your back. You right. probably would need like four people to carry it. It was heavy. I remember we lugged it from New York to Georgia out and then out to Colorado and that thing was heavy. Okay. It took two men to pick it up and move it. It was a piece of furniture. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, oh, well, here's a TV. Nobody cares. Um, but yeah, televisions were expensive items. Now they're commonplace. Telephones were expensive items. You couldn't own one. Ma Bell owned it. Mm. Now telephones are cheap. Computers are cheap. Now we want satellites to be cheap because we don't know those unknowns. What will people do with our satellites? What will people do with our data that hasn't been discovered yet? The killer app for space still isn't there. Someone's going to invent it. And we hope to be there. So in 1975, when we had the Soyuz uh, um, Apollo um, event, uh, mm -hmm. you were, I guess, about eight, maybe eight, nine. Yep. Yep. That really cemented it for me. I wanted to be a, an astronaut so bad after that. Um, and one of the joys in my life was actually getting to meet Tom Stafford later in life um, out in Oklahoma that when we were doing some rocket launches out there, that was a thrill because here is the man that I saw on the Apollo Soyuz and then to get to meet him. It's just like, yeah, all right, this is, this is a dream come true. Um, but yeah, I was at that point. Uh, my mom still has a Polaroid of me when I was about three years old building rocket ships out of Legos. Mm -hmm. Now, Legos were just the basic blocks back then, so this is an ugly spaceship, and I've got this big, huge grin on my face, you know, how kids you know, smile for the camera and they show all their teeth with me holding this little little thing. I My, my head's been in space no matter what I'm thinking about. Now you wanted to be an astronaut. Um, how long, how far along did you continue with that as a career choice? Um, I was actually trying to be an astronaut all the way up through college. Um, I figured, okay, all I've got to do is get to, you know, two bachelor's degrees, maybe a master's degree, master two languages, be able to run, you know, 10 miles. I think I can do this. At the time I was a 97 pound asthmatic, but I thought I could do it, you know, the power of positive thinking and all that. Um, college didn't work out for me. It turned out to be more of a challenge than I was expecting. And that hurt. So, yeah, I moved on from college and I learned things the hard way through the School of Hard Knocks by going out there and doing. Was that the right approach? No. But in that moment, I knew I would never be an astronaut. And then the private space industry starts up. Okay, 20 years later than I wanted it to, but here's the private, we are now on the cusp of the private space industry. Okay, as with that color TV, the price came down. I mean, it's $400,000 or $450,000 now, but 10 years from now, that will be affordable. And a lot of people are gonna be going on these trips to space. Is it gonna be orbital? Yeah, probably not. But still, it's like skydiving. Skydiving was expensive. Now skydiving is cheap. Same thing's going to happen here. When it becomes relatively inexpensive that people will go, hey, this is something I want to do. When it's equivalent in cost to going to Mount Everest, that's the game. And then I'm going to be in that spacecraft. I'm going to go to space and I'm going to look down on the earth and see what I have seen in my mind since I was a small child. And um, how confident are you that you're, you feel you're going to be able to have that experience? 
it will happen in my lifetime. I am not going to pass from this earth until I have seen it from space. Um, unless something cataclysmic happens um, or there's a regulatory event that causes it to just shut down, this is going to happen. And I'll get there. And if it's by research, if it's by you know, earning a million dollars, whatever. Uh, but I'm going to go. And no, I'm, I'm, 55 million doesn't seem like that much, actually. It doesn't. When you think about it, all right, an orbital trip. Hmm. Hmm. And then, you know, we've got Axios. They're going to have a private space station here um, by 2028. Uh, initially attached to the International Space Station, and then it'll be pulled, it'll actually break away and they'll form their own station. Um, Bigelow Aerospace is not out of this. They've got their own uh, BA 330s that they can turn into a space station. That would be neat to see. Um, I expect there to be hotels. They'll be the first hotel in space by 2030. Do, do you know anything about Bigelow? Because they kind of like dropped off the radar for the past couple of years. They're mothballed right now is all I know, and but they will come back when the market is there for them to come back. So. And I mean, other than just what's externally available, do you do you have any reason to believe that? The space economy is just getting started. Okay? We're in the cell phone era circa 1995. A few the, people. the thing about Bigelow that's really puzzling. Um, so, you know, um, Jim Bridenstine, the NASA administrator at the time, you know, is uh, talking about the new commercial um, access to the station. Bigelow says they've, uh, you know, contracted with SpaceX to, um, you know, have some Falcon 9 rockets and that they'll be training the astronauts and they start a space operations division. And then, um, you know, they don't get selected for being the, the, the lunar gateway uh, habitation provider. And then COVID hits and then they completely shut down, go completely radio silent, mm -hmm. lay off all their people as far as I know. Uh, and I haven't heard a peep out of them since. So I've been really concerned. Yeah. Um... Now I knew when it, when COVID hit that they were going to mothball. I mean that was the scuttlebutt in the in the industry, and mothball is not shut down. It's not, you know, okay, we're done. We're just going to close this, sell all the property, and and give it up. Everything's still there. Now time is ticking, and the experience needed to build those stations, just like the Apollo, you could not build a Saturn V today. There, there, the the tooling is gone, the people who knew how to build it, they're retired or gone. You could not build the Saturn V. It's an impossible task. So Bigelow needs to be careful that this doesn't happen to them. But I mean, they've got some fantastic IP. Their systems are proven. They have three of them on orbit. And Genesis 1 and 2 are still up there, still working. And they, they officially shut them down, but they're still up there, still doing their job. They haven't, you know, disintegrated like people were afraid they would. Uh, the beam unit on the space station is still used for storage. They, I, they're just waiting for their moment. And I think that they're going to come back. I, and I also think that you're going to see companies doing things you never thought. They're like, well, why would you do that? And oh, wait, suddenly that makes sense. Those haven't been discovered yet. Um, Somebody is going to, like, if you build a BA-330, all right, this is just, here's, here's a fantastical. If you could build a BA-330 or an even larger inflatable habitat, someone is going to invent a set of wings that you can use inside said habitat. We don't know what those will look like. We don't know how they'll work. Um, or a personal jet pack that lets you play in, in zero G without having to go outside in a, in a spacesuit. What kind of gym equipment would you build for zero G? What kind of sports would you invent, invent for zero G? All of this hasn't been done yet. So yeah, there's opportunity for them to, to come back and, and invent something really cool 
or take, take what they have, get it up there, continue to evolve those designs, build something even cooler, and then a new market opens up. That, that's how the world moves. It, it doesn't stop inventing. It might slow down, it might turn inward, but eventually we turn outward again and we start inventing some cool stuff. And yeah, it's gonna be amazing. I I kind of envision uh, humanity as being like uh, maybe a, a big group of hikers or, you know, a, a set of a long train on a, a rail. And you could kind of envision like the people towards the front as being the more fluent and technologically capable ones. And the people that rarely end are the, the people in um, completely, um, you know, severe poverty, you know, a really subsistence um, life. And then you kind of have like everybody else string up between them. And, you know, if you, you look back in like the 1800s and before, there really wasn't that much difference between the life experience of, of one or the other. Uh, you know, I mean, you, you might have a nicer place to live, but you probably still don't have indoor plumbing. You know? mm -hmm. It's not like uh, uh, things are really all that different for you. I mean, you, you may have people waiting on you, but they're cooking the meals the same way that, that they're cooking. And it seems like over the 1900s, the, the length of that has really spread out. Like, mm -hmm. and even like with the, the space that you're talking about, you know, I, I just see that that train like completely decoupling uh, both ends. Like the, the, the experiences of one end versus the other are just so incomprehensible to either one of them. Like mm -hmm. the person at the very front, really, they would have no way of relating to the person at the very end and the person at the very end, like vice versa. It's just, um, I mean, it, what do you think about this? That is a distinct possibility. That can happen. But I also would like to point out that um, just like a train, everybody's connected. The rich can have a very expensive cell phone. I mean, somebody was doing like gold plated diamond encrusted iPhones and they were costing $25,000. It's still a phone. And some people still buy Rolexes, which I have no clue about. I mean, like right. uh, $2 time problem solved, you know? Yeah, it, it's still a watch. I mean, I have my Apple Watch. Sorry, I'm a Mac-based life form. I have iPhone, Apple Watch, Mac computer. It's what I know. It's systems that work for me. But again, the distance between, while the, the train might be getting longer and the distance between the most affluent and the least affluent are, it, it seems to be spreading apart, that back end is starting to catch up. Okay. 1925, middle of Tennessee, there's no electricity. Okay. There are still dirt floor houses. Okay. My, my great grandparents in Georgia grew up in a house that had no running water, no electricity and a dirt floor. So we've we've moved from that. That can that part continues to move forward. Are there people who are going to be left behind? Yes, and we need to work hard to make that number as small as possible. It will never be zero, but we need to make it as small as possible. But go to some place that you think technology wouldn't be hanging around. And you can go to the middle of India and the, the poorest of the poor have access to cell phones with internet. Absolutely. It, the, the, I mean, the cell phone, and, and that gives you access to so much. I mean, you want to learn something, go to YouTube, type in, you know, how to change a tire. And then you get 40 videos. And then you're like, how to change a, a tire on an auto rickshaw in India. And then you've got like the, the, the tire that you, you know, you're like, oh, okay, I could do that. <laughs> and there's somebody who has that information. Their information is the great equalizer. And we are moving from the industrial age to the information age. So this is just, the, again, this is just the beginning, but there is no reason not to be able to learn anything. Want to learn a different language? There's somebody teaching it. Want to study um, acupuncture? 
you can learn the basics of it. Now, don't go doing that without going through medical training, but um, you can at least understand what's going on. You can, you can whet those appetites for anything that you want to look at, both good and bad. But that information is bringing them back into that train forward. Okay. When people are educated, when, specifically when women are educated, they have fewer children, which puts less of a strain on the family. When men are educated, they develop more of a skill set. Um, same thing for women. Anytime you can get education into the picture, suddenly the world changes. And India still has areas that are fairly poor, but they're becoming more and more affluent. China the same way. This is an amazing change. China in the 80s, most of its population was still, you know, subsistence farmers. That isn't the case today. They're a major powerhouse, and they've done that in the span of 40 years. Information changes the game. So the, the people who are left behind at this point are those who want to be there. You have to want to be there because you can learn anything you want all right and i don't like the i don't like the condition of my life then change it exactly oh, i don't have the money to do it no but you have a cell phone and you have access to the internet and education is the first step the money comes later all right you don't have to go to harvard you don't have to go to mit although mit was my first choice when i went and wanted to go to college just missed it by that much <laughs> Uh, it's so, and my life would have been different if I had gotten into MIT, I can tell you that right now. Um, but you can do those things. I mean, I don't have a degree in aerospace engineering, but I understand the thermodynamics of spacecraft. I understand, you know, orbital mechanics of said spacecraft. I know how to build said spacecraft so they can survive to get to orbit. Um, I have... <laughs> This is stuff that I've learned. I've learned the electronics and how to, how to balance all of those components. Do I know all of it in depth? No, that's what I have experts for. But I know enough to communicate with those experts and say, oh, you put one piece together and then the next piece and the next piece and the next thing you know, you've got a company and you're building stuff that's going to space. That's awesome. I mean, I started in my basement. Our tagline was from basement to orbit. And we started in the basement till the wife said, uh, can anything cause the house to burn down? Like, well, You're like, that's an interesting point. <laughs> yeah. So we moved from the basement into um, a workshop that was 140 square feet. We're now in a 600 square foot facility. We're planning out our 2,500 square foot facility which will then migrate to a 10,000 square foot facility. So we have a plan. We know what we're going to do and how we're going to get there. But did I know how to do all of this when I started? No, but the internet was helpful and I made the right connections. I talked with people who knew what they were doing in this industry, absorbed enough information to be dangerous and then have the experts to keep you from blowing yourself up. Uh, Ta -da. <laughs> it, it's an overused phrase, but it's not rocket science. Uh, it's business. It's networking. It's understanding people. It's working with humanity. And even if you look at uh, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, I mean, Jeff Bezos came from a broken household. Uh, you know, his uh, father wasn't around when he was young. He was raised by his grandparents. Um, you know, a solid yeah, middle, um, you know, economy type lifestyle. Uh, so it's not like he came from affluent wealth that was handed mm -hmm. down. And then Elon Musk, you know, um, grew up in South Africa, figured mm -hmm. out some way to get to Canada, worked in like uh, really difficult situations to, to kind of earn his keep. Mm -hmm. um, somehow made it down to California, got a, went to Stanford and, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, the internet came along at the right time and he had the right idea and yeah, it's just like, uh, 
and it's not like yeah you know they didn't have competition i mean i barnes and nobles was there i mean people were telling jeff early on you should sell your online bookstore to barnes and nobles you know why why are you <laughs> how do you think you compete <laughs> Yep. Now they're now they could buy Barnes and Noble if they wanted to. Um, yeah, it's and you notice that it's. I won't say it's um, always folks who are in non affluent situations, but typically it's people who have drive. And you can come from any any part of the the economic spectrum. If you have drive, you'll figure it out. I mean, drive of, and grit. Grit. Drive and thing. grit. The, one of the, my favorite motivational speakers is Les Brown, not the band leader, Les Brown, the motivational speaker. I mean, he was born with his twin brother on the floor of an abandoned home in Miami, was adopted by a single parent, raised in a home with seven other children, and they were, they were dirt poor. And he became one of the most renowned motivational speakers because that's what he wanted to do. Like drive and grit. Yep. If you have the determination. Or even Oprah Winfrey. Uh, you know, she was uh, sexually molested by an uncle when she was young. A lot of people uh, let that experience define their lives and keep them down. And, and mm -hmm. that she was able to do what she, she did. So. Yep. Yeah. It, the thing is that regardless of your circumstances, if you really, really want to make it happen, you can. And I think that's that's really the message of humanity is we don't give up very easily. We will make things happen. Maybe not in our lifetime, but it will happen. I mean, imagine the folks in the Middle Ages when they were building cathedrals. They knew they would never live to see its completion. They knew that their grandchildren probably wouldn't live to see its completion. But they did it anyway. Same thing with space. We need to understand that if we want humanity to survive and succeed, we need to have abundance of resources. If we continue to work with models of scarcity, it won't work. Peter Diamandis is, is a, a, a proponent of um, abundance. Well, you go to space. I, the, NASA just identified the contents of an asteroid that if we were to mine it out of existence would replace all of the metal on earth twofold everything that's ever been pulled out of the ground gold platinum iron all of it on this one asteroid and it's worth trillions of dollars in our economy and with zero ecological impact of mining Right. So you lose, you lose the ecological damage, you gain everything. Space is where we need to be, full stop. Space is where we need to be. It's the, going to be the frontier that defines humanity over the next three, four centuries. And then we'll figure out where we go from there. Well, Joe, I, uh, unfortunately, my day job is about to intrude itself on my life. I, <laughs> I understand. I've got to get to, to, to building satellites here. So, <laughs> but it was such a pleasure to connect with you. And I, uh, I, I think we'll be talking again soon. Um, just anytime, let me know. We'll, we'll schedule something. We'll, we'll chat. Okay. Take care, Joe. All right. Thanks. You have a good one now.